So um, now on to the framework and the models that uh, uh, we developed. Our last framework, this one published uh, earlier this year, it had uh, six sections. Uh, you can see them here. Uh, if anybody wants to talk about uh, uh, the models that I'm not going to go over, the ontology we created for the grid or the economics or the cybersecurity, we've got a lot of work on cybersecurity. I'm happy to dive into them. Uh, but for our conversation, I want to focus on the sections uh, that I have highlighted, right? It's a few of the models and then a little bit about testing and certification. Uh, and in that, uh, we'll talk about the standards landscape and how we can improve the availability of testing and certification to enhance interoperability uh, for power systems. So uh, as we pulled together this framework, I want to re reiterate our job is to coordinate. It is not to write on our own. Uh, we held a number of public workshops. We had more than 275 unique participants. This doesn't count. Uh, uh, you know, this isn't double counting some of the people who surprisingly enough to us, like followed us around the country and showed up at every single one of our workshops. That was a surprise to me. I wasn't sure why anybody gets so excited about standards, but some people did, but we had more than 275 unique participants. Um, we uh, had a, a public comment period. We published it in the Federal Register. So really, we're trying to show something and develop something that uh, reflects industry and stakeholder priorities uh, and not just uh, one perspective. So one of the most important things that the framework does is help us think about the smart grid, both where we are and where we need to get to. So to help us do that, the framework provides a few models. Uh, importantly, the conceptual model has undergone meaningful updates in this framework and the communication pathways scenarios uh, are completely new. So we're going to uh, talk about them a little bit coming up. Uh, we hope that these tools will uh, help us all work to understand and modernize our grid and system. So in this uh, chart, you can see the evolution of our conceptual model over the past 10 years, right? Let's dive a little bit deeper into this. A couple of things are important to note. There are, uh, there are seven domains in the system. Uh, these domains represented by these uh, clouds uh, allow people and organizations to understand where they exist physically within the system and with whom they must interact. Um, the power flows, which are indicated by the dotted yellow lines are relatively simple. Uh, and the communication flows indicated by the blue lines uh, that are needed to operate and optimize the system uh, are uh, pretty complex. And in, in fact, to be honest, the few linkages not shown in this diagram were an effort by me simply to have something more meaningful than an N minus one complexity uh, diagram. So over the years, while these fundamental concepts have remained consistent, there have been updates. Uh, you can see the power flows have moved from a unidirectional system uh, to uh, a, a somewhat more complex configuration. Uh, and, you know, there's more. Um, some of the changes in the version uh, of, in this version of the conceptual model include uh, more automation, sensing and control in the distribution domain. So compared to uh, pr the prior conceptual model, this domain not only has more pictures of fancy gadgets, right? You can even see a server farm in there. Woo, we have a cartoon. Um, but also larger domains, uh, uh, it's a large domain and placed more centrally because the distribution system is where a lot of the innovation and management will take place moving forward. Um, we also have diversification of the generation, including DER domain and elongation of that domain. So it can graphically uh, represent the physical proximity of certain resources to different portions of the system. So for example, right, a nuclear plant would definitely feed into the bulk system, but combustion turbines are a bit more flexible and depending on their implementation could go either to the transmission or the distribution domain. And of course, the smaller scale renewable and dis uh, distributed resources are located more towards the uh, uh, distribution and customer domains. We also have some customer diversification in here with some you know, new pictures showing different times, kinds of customers who would use energy differently, right? But this is a, a ridiculously high level of abstraction. It allows us to talk about big picture concepts, but it doesn't allow us to say much that is meaningful. And so each of these domains actually has a, uh, um, a, a deeper uh, 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 diagram, one level down that uh, really helps us uh, explore these concepts in the, in, in the, and graphically visually represent them in a little bit uh, uh, more detail. 
Uh, we're not yet to the technical issues. We're still at the conceptual uh, uh, frame. But right here, you can see that the generation, including DER domain, right? So this is dominated by power flows. That's all the dotted yellow lines. But what's important in this updated version of the model is threefold, right? So meaningful power is now generated and introduced directly to the distribution system. You can see those dotted lines going right into the distribution domain. That is new for this year or for this version. Um, the customers participate in the solution space. Right, but their primary objective for their resources may be something other than pure generation. That's represented here by the dotted yellow line that begins inside the customer domain and then transits into and through the generation including DER domain before connecting to the distribution domain. By having that power flow as part of the generation including DER domain, we're acknowledging that though that power that resource is part of the solution space. Yet by having it originate in the customer domain, we're emphasizing that they may want to do something else with it than just provide power to the grid. And by having it tie into the distribution domain rather than transmission domain, we're showing that it ties in in a slightly different place. And that gets to the third point, which is that depending on the scale of resource, it will be introduced at different points within, um, uh, within these domains. You can see that the customer resources on the you know, the secondary uh, uh, feeder, uh, probably connecting through a service uh, uh, transformer, uh, whereas other resources connect into the distribution system uh, at the, at the uh, uh, substation. And so uh, th these are just some of the important concepts that we're trying to convey. Uh, we do it with this tiered model. You can see right here, that we have one of these conceptual model diagrams and descriptions for each domain. I don't expect you to go through these diagrams on the slide, it's too small, uh, but they're all available in the framework and you can see them and, and go through them. But the challenge from this is, we've been talking about big picture ideas. Now, what do these concepts mean for interoperability? So to address that question, earlier versions of the framework developed this diagram, this cartoon, to graphically depict the communication interfaces uh, between key smart grid systems overlaid on their conceptual model domains. It's a pretty straightforward representation of what communicates with what. But for this version of the framework, we wanted to use these diagrams to explore a more complicated set of issues. It's not just about how a utility operates today or might operate tomorrow, but what does interoperability look like for emerging system architectures? And as we look to the emerging diversity across the electrical system, we see that things are getting really complicated. And so in this version, we actually develop four different communication pathway scenarios to represent different architectures and different conditions that could be found on the system. So these are in fact inspired by the Department of Energy's reference grid architectures and each scenario that we develop then helps us explore how communications, asset ownership, and interoperability requirements may change with different grid operational strategies. Um, this communication pathway scenario is the one that everybody likes to go into because it's the most complicated looking one. And it focuses on a high DER environment where distributed and customer sited resources play an increasingly important role in system operation. So here we can see that the value stacking of multi-use resources introduces some complexity to the communications and interoperability strategy. Right. So in one example, an inverter or an electric vehicle or a demand response asset selling into markets as part of the generation, including DER domain, may first have to interact through a thermostat or some other device acting as a home energy hub and then go through the home area gateway to the Internet. And then that information could reach some combination of an aggregator or other third party service provider, a market operator and the utility. And at the same time, there may be a secondary communication path that travels from the device to a submeter to the utility meter and then to the AMI telemetry network. So contrast that to a utility managed direct load control asset like a water heater, and that may have a communication path that runs directly from the utility to the control device. And so we use these scenarios to examine the different interoperability requirements that may emerge across the system. And you, you know, please check out the framework to review these communication pathway scenarios in detail.